Okay, let's start. Can I have your attention, please? So, regarding the homework, um, if you are using uh, merge sort or something like this, uh, that is elementary algorithm covered in previous courses, you can just say, uh, let uh, we use merge sort to sort an array in times in time n log n, right? You don't have to describe uh, what um, uh, merge sort is, and of course you don't have to describe what binary search is. You can, these basic things you can just state, right? Okay, also I got a few email uh, uh, from uh, people that say that they are lost with the homework, so this is the deal, uh, during this first week, uh, give your best just using common sense because very little is necessary. You need to know, I'll give you a hint, you know that binary search is in log n time and that uh, hashing is in expected uh, constant time, right, to search. Very little else is needed, just uh, kind of common sense and logic, right? Now, after a week of trying, you can email to the admin for a request for hints, and we will email you back uh, hints for the problems that you have difficulties with, right? But definitely, in order to appreciate the essence of the solution, by all means, first try to do it yourself, just to practice. And then if you are still stuck, <coughs> email for help, and I'll also organize <coughs> some of our very best tutors, hopefully, if I can <coughs> coerce them to do office hours on top of my office hours so that you can come and uh, ask for help, right? Given that there are more than 700 of you. Um, so that's about it. So first give it a try because the whole purpose of taking this course is to improve your problem solving abilities, right? So um, even though it might be frustrating if you haven't seen such problems before, uh, please do um, a good uh, attempt on your own first. Okay, so secondly, I'll try also to find on the web good resources for the material that we covered. Uh, but the good news is that after we finish the fast Fourier transform and have a nice uh, lecture from Dolby people, uh, we will move to material that involves much less mathematics, if at all. So there will be more kind of combinatorial algorithms, but sometimes we will have to prove that they solve the problem, but this will be relatively simple math, right? So don't despair. It's not that the whole uh, course will be uh, jam-packed with uh, mathematics. So as I mentioned, um, FFT is uh, arguably by far the most important algorithm today. Because whenever you use, please, if, I, if you can be quieter so that you don't disrupt others. So, um, because whenever you use your mobile phone to compress your voice, your mobile phone applies fast Fourier transform to the samples of, your, of the sound of your voice, right? Uh, also, when you use uh, MPEG or JPEG uh, images and videos are compressed on a method that is essentially a slight variation of FFT called discrete cosine transform, but it's just a, essentially a special case of the fast Fourier transform. And none of these algorithms would be as efficient as they are, uh, right, because you have to decode things in real time if you are watching video without the the speed of the fast Fourier transform. And also in finances, when you analyze, when you look for periodicities, uh, the fast Fourier transform is what you apply. So, uh, so bear with me that there is a little bit of 
kind of technical complications here, but they are very, very much worthwhile. Okay, so let me quickly remind you coefficient versus value representation of polynomials, right? Value representation is simple. Uh, simply, if I give you, uh, say, if your polynomial is of degree n, and I give you n plus 1 many inputs whatsoever, it can be from 0 to n or can be from uh, 5 to uh, n plus uh, uh, n plus how many, five is it, uh, or n plus uh, uh, four. Um, as, so just any inputs for as long as these uh, inputs, these uh, numbers are distinct. So the value representation is simply the collection of tuples of input and the value of your polynomial at that input, right? And if you represent your polynomial in the coefficient form, then to compute the values, uh, uh, cleanest way of seeing that is what you are essentially doing. You are multiplying this uh, van der Mond matrix with a vector of the coefficients, right? Because if you do the multiplication, you see one multiplies a zero, that's the constant term. Then you have x zero times a one, that will give you the next term, and finally, uh, you will have x0 to the power n times a n, that's precisely the leading term, right? So uh, matrix times these vectors gives you the sequence of values, right? And similarly, if you have the values, right, then to retrieve the coefficients of your polynomials that has such values for these inputs x0 to xn, all you have to do is multiply the vector of values now with the inverse matrix, right? That's direct consequence from here. If you multiply both sides with the inverse matrix of this matrix, that's precisely what you get. So it's very easy, well, quote unquote, very easy to commute from coefficient form into value form and vice versa from values to coefficients with one trouble. How complicated is this? How complex in terms of time complexity? Well, you have n inputs here to multiply with n inputs here. So that's n multiplications for each value. Altogether, this will be n squared many multiplications because you can assume that the powers these numbers will be constant and all the powers are pre-computed and stored in a matrix so they don't take any multiple, you know, you, know, you simply store this matrix and you don't have to compute it all over again each time when you are uh, changing the coefficients, right? So the problem is that this process of going back and forth, uh, this is also a pre-computed matrix, this inverse matrix of this matrix, you pre-compute it and store it. But it takes n squared many steps. And for many real-time applications like decoding videos or encoding videos, that's prohibitively expensive. So all what, well, not all, but one of the beautiful things that useful things that fast Fourier transform does is it allows you to this, to do this change between value representation of polynomials and coefficient representation of polynomials in time n log n. And if n is large, if n is uh, <coughs> of order, say, 10,000 or 100,000, that's gigantic saving, right? So the importance of, uh, one of the important uses of fast Fourier transform is to enable this uh, uh, change from the coefficient representation and value representation very efficiently in time and log n. Okay, so uh, let us now see how we can use this uh, to um, multiply polynomials fast. <coughs> uh, so if you have two polynomials, P A of X, and PB of X, if you have to multiply them, and you multiply them by brute force, right? Again, you have to multiply each coefficient 
uh, of the first polynomial with every coefficient of the second polynomial. So again, it will cost you n squared, right? And this is again prohibitively expensive because as I mentioned last time, multiplication of two polynomials is equivalent to applying filters to signals. And that's exactly, that's a kind of bread and butter operation in signal processing, right? So it's not really that uh, we are interested in multiplying two polynomials, but for an application, which is evaluation of a convolution, which is in effect nothing but a multiplication of two polynomials. So how do we do that? Well, we convert these two polynomials from the coefficient form into the value form. But even though each polynomial is of degree n and you would need thus only n plus one many values to uniquely determine this polynomial, yes? Okay, inverting the matrix costs zero for the following reason. Uh, the degree of the polynomial will be a fixed number, uh, right? This is a design parameter. For example, if your filter has 129 taps, right? The degree of your polynomial will be 128, so you will need 129 values and you freeze these values, you, you pre-compute the matrix and the inverse matrix and you store it. But both of them will be pre-computed? Yes, both of them will be, both matrices will be uh, pre-computed. So the question, sorry, I forget that I should repeat the question each time because the recording, people who watch this later cannot hear the question. The question was how come I didn't account for computing the matrix and, to, uh, and inverting the matrix. But that's, that costs nothing because this will be these numbers, x0 uh, up to xn, and of course n will be frozen and pre-computed and stored in memory, right? So there will be no cost uh, related to that. Okay, so now as I say, as I said, uh, we will transform PA from the coefficient form into value form and the same with polynomial PB. But you see, our goal is to multiply these two polynomials, but the poly product polynomial will be of degree 2n. So to uniquely determine it, we need 2n plus 1 many values. So for that reason, we will overdetermine the polynomial P. Uh, the polynomial PA by computing 2n plus 1 many values at some fixed inputs. And the whole trick of fast Fourier transform is to cleverly select the values for x0 up to xn, right, to, in order to allow a fast algorithm. So we compute the values of our two polynomials at these fixed points, right, in Karatsupa, these fixed points were from minus n to n. But as you will see soon, uh, this is not uh, optimal, right? So we then multiply these two polynomials in the value form. How do we multiply? Well, you see, if my polynomial, the first polynomial has, at say, input x0 has value 3. And my second polynomial at x0 has value 5. What's the value of the product for a polynomial at x0? 15, right? So to find the value of the product polynomial, you simply multiply the values of the two polynomials, right? And this is the only place where serious multiplications uh, take place, right, because you have no control how big are the coefficients of these uh, uh, polynomials. So, and uh, it's the only place, as you will see, when in a product at least one of the operands will not be a constant. So these are the expensive parts, just doing this uh, 
uh, to n plus one many multiplications. Now you simply say, well, assume that my polynomial, the product polynomial, has these coefficients which I have to determine, right? But I do know uh, the values of my polynomial. Um, so, okay, the key question is, uh, what values should we take from x0 to x2n to avoid explosion of size when we evaluate uh, uh, these uh, powers, right? You remember in Karatsuba, let me, you see in Karatsuba, uh, if uh, xn goes from minus n to n, you will have entries like minus n to the, or n to power n. So if n is, say, 10, if your polynomial is of degree 10, you will have already a value 10 to the 10. So now the trick is how to avoid explosion of size. Use complex, Use complex numbers. That's exactly right. And lo and behold, uh, to do that, let me kind of give you a crash course on complex numbers just to refresh you. So complex numbers uh, are representable in two ways. Uh, one is uh, by their real part and their imaginary part, right? Or another way to represent them is by their modulus, uh, which is the square root of the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary part, and their argument. Uh, so what, this is the modulus, the length of this segment. If this is your complex number z, then this will be by Pythagoras theorem, excuse me, exactly real part squared plus imaginary part squared and then square root of this sum. The argument is nothing but this angle between the, the vector that corresponds to your complex number and the positive side of the x-axis. And usually it is taken to range between positive uh, pi and negative pi or between zero and two pi. Sometimes that's more convenient, uh, right? So, um, and uh, if, in case you forgot, so exponentiation is extendable from real numbers to complex numbers in the following way that e to the power i times, so um, the, the polar form uh, is, uh, you can see from this picture, this will be cosine of the arg, this will be sine of the arg, right? So the real part is modulus, right? Times the cosine give, will give you the real part and modulus times sine the arg will give you the imaginary part. And you can write this sum, cosine arg z plus i, I sine times arg z, just as e to the i times arg z, and lo and behold, in this exponential notation, all the laws of exponentiation that hold for uh, real numbers also apply directly without any change to complex numbers. Right? So if I square e to the i omega z, this will be simply e to the two times i omega z. Okay, so in general, if you take a complex number to certain power n, as I said, the laws of exponentiation, uh, all the algebraic laws directly carry from uh, reals to complex numbers uh, to um, exponentiate this uh, product, you exponentiate each term. So you have modulus of z to the power n times e uh, uh, to the power i times arg z to the power n. But when you have iterated powers, then the powers simply multiply. So you get that this is e to the n times arg z, and then in trigonometric form, you get precisely uh, this. So now, so for example, if I square a number, its modulus will 
be squared and its argument will be doubled, right? Because if, if n is equal to two, the, you get two times the original argument. Now, the, now you can see how to choose numbers whose powers do not grow. Namely, it's enough to take a set of complex numbers whose modulus is one. Uh, that, so that will be the numbers that all sit on the unit circle around the origin, right? So, um, so what is a root of unity? Well, nth root of unity is exactly that, nth root of one. What is nth root of one? Well, if you live in the complex domain, there is more than uh, one solution, right? Namely, when will z to the n be equal to one? z to the n is equal to one if its modulus has to be one, right? Because when you, expo when you take uh, uh, this number to power n, you will get modulus to the n. If this is one, uh, modulus has to be equal to one. And what happens with the argument? The argument gets multiplied by n. So to get one, you have to have that the argument is integer number of two pi's, right? Because only if you get multiple of two pi's, right, you will, taking your number to certain power will multiply its argument, so you will be wrapping around the origin, right, and you have to hit uh, argument zero. So the argument has to be, n times the argument has to be an integer multiple of two pi, and then, of course, this gives you that arg z is of the form two pi times any integer k divided by n. But uh, how many roots uh, uh, can, uh, does uh, one of order n, can one have? Well, any polynomial, so this is the solution to the equation uh, z to the n equals to one, or alternatively, z to the n minus one equals to zero. So any polynomial of degree n can have at most n distinct roots. And lo and behold, we found when k goes from 0 to n minus 1, we found already um, n many roots. So the conclusion is that the roots of unity of order n are precisely these complex numbers all sitting on the unit circle uh, with, the, with arguments that are integer multiples of 2 pi divided by n, right? So, now you see that uh, if you take uh, a, a root of unity to certain power, to any power, its modulus will remain 1. But now you have even nicer feature that if you take any root right, and you take it to certain power, all what you can get is just another root of unity. So taking powers of the roots of unity, you remain in the same set of the roots of unity. Let's see that. So, uh, by the way, this quantity omega n, which is uh, e to the i, 2 pi divided by n, so roots of, root of unity with the smallest argument is, uh, it's called a primitive root of unity, not because it is uncivilized, but because you can get any root of unity as power of that root of unity. And clearly, um, this is not uh, the only property of uh, this particular number, you can take uh, this to any power k that is relatively prime with n, and you will still have the same uh, feature. So let's see if we have omega n to power k, and then we take it to power n. Well, familiar uh, rules for uh, exponents apply. 
So these iterated exponents will multiply, right? So now uh, you can exchange and put inside n and outside k. Just swap n and k. But what is omega n to power n? Well, omega n is a root of unity of order n. And the definition of this is precisely that its power should equal to 1, right? So omega n to the n is 1, and lo and behold, you get that this is 1 to the k, i.e. 1. What does this mean? It means uh, uh, all the powers of this primitive root of unity are also roots of unity of the same order. And lo and behold, there are exactly n distinct uh, of them when k goes between 0 and uh, n minus 1. Now, these are the guys that will be inputs to your polynomials. And then in the matrix, right, if you look back to the matrix that we had, all these powers will have modulus, namely absolute value, equal to 1. So neither do they vanish, nor do they explode. When you compute these, they will all be, essentially there will be only n, um, n plus 1 many of these, right, when um, uh, exponents range between 0 to n, right? So that this matrix will have uh, only n plus 1 distinct entries. Yes, yeah, we will see that, how, uh, what happens to them. So they will just be, these guys will be, uh, well, you will see what are the values here. There will be lots of repetitions, right, because of this wrapping around uh, when you go uh, in a circle. Okay, so let us see now what we have to do. Okay, so... Uh, these, okay, how do we multiply two roots of unity? Well, remember exponential notation. This, this represents, it just uh, stands for e to the i times 2 pi k divided by n. But in exponential notation, both of these guys have the same basis, which is just e, right? And so um, how do we... Um, multiply e to something to the power k and then e to something to power m, well, we simply add uh, the exponents, right? But because there are only um, n many of them, this can only go between 0 and uh, um, n minus uh, uh, 1, and if it exceeds n uh, if it exceeds x to the n minus 1, it means that you just went around the circle, uh, uh, right? So this will be uh, equivalent to omega to the L, where L is uh, uh, the sum mod n, right? The remainder of this when you divide it by n. So uh, So the upshot is that the product of any two roots of unity of the same order is just another root of unity of the same order. And the same applies, of course, to powers. When you multiply a root of unity to some power with itself. Okay. So, but notice sum of two complex numbers that sit on the unit circle will not be on the unit circle, right? It will have a, a different modulus that can be either uh, right, bigger or smaller because the sum is uh, as sum of vectors, right, essentially. Now, this is, so not only that the roots of unity will not give us the headache that their sizes when we put them in that matrix, or equivalently, when we evaluate polynomials, not only that their sizes will not explode, but they will just, um, uh, they will stay within the same set of just uh, n many uh, different 
n plus 1 many values if your polynomial is of order n. So, um, so they have this property that is called cancellation lemma. If you have omega, if you have a root of unity of some composite order, k times n, right? For example, if this is, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, 15, if uh, uh, you have a root of unity of order 15, that's root of unity of order 3 times 5. And you take it to some power, say, 3 times 7. Well, the exponent on the top with the multiple of the basis can cancel out, right? And as you will see, this will be a very important property. So let's see why this is the case. Well, uh, what is uh, this uh, root of unity? Well, it's uh, omega kn to the power k times n. But omega kn is just e to the power i times 2 pi divided by kn. And now you just use basic algebra to take this to the power km. All what you have to do is you multiply the exponent. So here it is. Now in the exponent k and k cancel, right? And you get that this is just e to the 2 pi times n divided by n. And lo and behold, you can take m outside the of the bracket, and you get this is precisely omega n to the power m. So lo and behold, you can cancel k in the exponent with k in the basis, right? And this will be <coughs> important to simplify our calculations. This is actually the most important case and a fast Fourier transform will crucially use precisely this uh, uh, special case when m is equal to 2. What does this say? If you have a root of unity of order 2n and uh, taken to power k, if you square it, all that happens is that the order drops by half. So the squares of the roots of unity of order 2n will produce uh, roots of all the roots of unity of order n. Now notice how many distinct values are there here? Omega uh, of basis 2n to power k k can go between 0 to 2n minus 1. So altogether, there are 2n many roots. But the total number of squares is only n. So if you take roots of unity of certain even order, you find their squares. The total distinct number of values that you get is only 1 half. And that is what will make our divide and conquer algorithm work. So if you have roots of unity of certain even order, you evaluate all of their squares, you get only half many values, right? And that's crucial feature. That's exactly the only, uh, the main application of this cancellation lemma for FFT. Okay, so now we have to introduce something that is called discrete Fourier transform. So that's a transform, which means input is one sequence or one vector. The output is another sequence, or if you see it alternatively, another vector of the same size. So it's a transform because it transforms one vector into another vector. Fast Fourier transform, despite its name, it's not a transform. It's an algorithm that is used to efficiently evaluate the discrete Fourier transform. Okay, so fast Fourier transform is not a separate transform. It's just an algorithm. So let's see what discrete Fourier transform is. And if you look at... Uh, signal processing books, uh, often they just give you an ugly formula 
uh, and you have to memorize uh, what it is, uh, when in fact uh, it's easy to describe it intuitively in a way that you will never forget it. What is the discrete Fourier transform of this sequence? Well, given this sequence, I can form the corresponding polynomial whose coefficients are precisely these uh, elements of that sequence. So it will be a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus plus a n minus 1 to the power x minus 1. The discrete Fourier transform is simply the collection of all the values of this polynomial of all the roots of unity of the same order as its degree. Right, so if you have a sequence I0, A1, A2 up to An, the discrete Fourier transform, rather than seeing it as a formula, you memorize it as a concept. Discrete Fourier transform is obtained by forming the corresponding polynomial whose coefficients are elements of your sequence. So it's A0 plus A1x plus plus a n minus 1 to power n minus 1, right? And you simply substitute now the variable with all the roots of unity of order 1 plus the degree of your polynomial, right? Because uh, if your polynomial is of degree n minus 1, then you need n values to uniquely determine it. Uh, so in the Karatsuba trick, uh, we evaluated the polynomial at uh, values from minus n to n. Instead, what we will be doing, we will be evaluating our polynomials at roots of unity because no explosion of size appears, right? And on top of it, uh, rather than n squared many multiplications, as what we saw when you do matrix times, weight, um, times vector multiplication, it will be enough to kind of simultaneously compute them in time only n log n. So we will be getting this product of the matrix of size n by n times a vector of size n, kind of paradoxically, you know, brute force would uh, produce n squared many multiplications. Fast Fourier transform computes the product of this matrix with the vector only using n times log n many multiplications. So that's really interesting. You get a product of a matrix n by n by a vector of size n with only n times log n many multiplications because of special structure and feature of the matrix of the roots of unities. Okay, so th this way you will never forget what discrete Fourier transform is of a sequence. I give you the sequence, you write the corresponding polynomial, and then you substitute the variable if the, polyn if the polynomial is of degree n minus 1, you substitute the variable with uh, all the roots of unity of order n. And the sequence of values is what's called the discrete Fourier transform of the original sequence. A little bit later, we will see that this actually has a very clean geometric, purely geometric explanation what's going on. So if you do fast Fourier transform in this way, you, the amount that you have to memorize is literally zero. You can derive everything from the fundamental principles without having to memorize uh, anything. And I don't know for what reason, uh, rather than uh, presenting things in this way, uh, you know, in books, they actually just give you the ugly formula and tell you, how oh, this is discrete Fourier transform, memorize it, right? So, I don't know what's the reason for this. I was always wondering. You know that the ancient Egyptians uh, discovered uh, phonetic writing just a few hundred years after the hieroglyphics, right, with the... Uh, 
uh, when the symbols stand for meaning, right, rather than sound, the value of sound. But they never used it uh, except to spell, most of the time, just to spell the names of foreign kings. They kept using this uh, tremendously complicated uh, system of uh, ideograms, the hieroglyphics. Why do you think this is, why did they do that way? Uh? It's called uh, the same reason why you have bar association and similar. If you make it too simple, you are out of your job, right? So if you are a scribe, you can better keep it as complicated that only a few can uh, use it. And by the way, this has, of course, eventually then, um, Phoenicians introduced the phonetic alphabet and then for example, in ancient Greece, a litera, uh, being literate was a kind of commonplace. Everyone, at least in the upper class, uh, was able to read and write, right? Something similar is happening to the programming skills. In the beginning, right, uh, programming was a dark science that few people had command. And if you see first 12 employees of Microsoft, they had all long hair and they were all chanting om and similar things, right? And they were all spiritual gurus. Now, the thing is, almost all engineers pick up some programming skills, which means that you should not rely only on your programming skills. You have to build on top more important skills like design of new algorithms, but if you don't like that, at least find skills that are, for example, financial analysis or data analysis. If you want your degrees to last you your lifetime. I tell this, you know, I had a friend who who's specialized in power control in network distributions. And he's also in Australia, but is he doing his job? No. He is now in TV conferencing. Why? Because computers took over network control without any human intervention, right? So if you want your skill to last long, make sure that it's sufficiently diverse rather than just programming skills, that you can do either design of algorithms or analysis or data if you don't want to eventually flip uh, hamburgers at McDonald's. <laughs> Okay. Even that, they have a robot that feel, flips the hamburgers. Uh, my goodness. Uh, uh, it seems that the only thing that we are not uh, uh, willing to uh, give to the machines is the reproduction part. Okay. So, so, so. How do we, new way to for fast multiplication of polynomials, right? The strategy is essentially the same as we had before, except we will be evaluating not from minus n to n. We will have cleverer values that are roots of unity of order 2n plus 1, where k ranges between 0 and 2n. So, uh, by the way, because the discrete Fourier transform is of a sequence of size n, is also of size n, and we want to keep this uh, nice feature, then uh, notice here, this is a polynomial of degree uh, of degree n, right? And I am evaluating it uh, at 2n plus 1 many values rather than n plus 1 many values. To be able to use the term discrete Fourier transform, we simply pad our coefficients with n zeros so that this becomes a sequence of size 2n plus 1 so that we can simply say, and now, take the discrete Fourier transform of this sequence, which simply means evaluate this polynomial of 
faked degree 2n plus 1, sorry, of degree 2n at uh, 2n plus 1 many values that are precisely the roots of unity. Then we will simply multiply the values which will be done in linear time. There will be only 2n plus 1 many values. We will be able to do the multiplication using just 2n plus 1 many multiplications. And then we have to go back. From the values of the product, we want to retrieve the coefficients of the polynomial, right? So the, we need inverse operation that given these values, you can find the values of the coefficients. And amazingly enough, the operation that takes you backwards is almost identical to the operation that, take, that, uh, that you apply when you go forward. So finding the uh, values of the polynomial and uh, opposite, finding the coefficients once you have the values of the polynomial are essentially as, uh, accomplished by the very same algorithm with uh, two minuscule changes, as you will see. Okay, so this is the strategy. We pad our two polynomials. We take their discrete Fourier transforms, which is nothing but the sequence of va their values. We multiply the values pointwise, and then we take the inverse transformation to obtain these coefficients. But notice, instead of n squared many products that you would need to do by brute force, this whole process will be in time n log n. Multiplication will be linear, and DFT and inverse DFT will run in times n log n. So I have to leave you in suspension here. We will continue next week. Uh, we will finish the fast Fourier transform and then do combinatorial divide and conquer.